Hi, this is Darren Lyle. Let's uh, finish up the boots and see if we can move on to something else here. Um, I got some really good comments in the past few days. Thanks to everyone who's doing that, who's watching and commenting. Um, one of them was uh, get rid of the triangles in the half sphere here. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let me center it up here and what we can do is get rid of every other edge in this collection of triangles here and that will reduce the amount of pulling and um, smooth out the center of this object a bit. So I'll just go through and select every other edge here. And then I'll press X and dissolve edges and that will turn those triangles into quads. And hopefully that will help eliminate some of the creasing and pulling that can happen there at the top of that sphere. So thank you for reminding me about that. Another thing that someone asked was, why do I use um, edges to tighten up the corners of objects here instead of using the crease tool? And that's a good question. The crease tool can be accessed with Control e and then you can pick it from the menu here, or you can use Shift E. And what this does is it allows you to then move the mouse and sharpen up the edges, just like I'm doing by actually adding edges. And yes, this is a really good way to do this. Um, I got used to adding edges because I began working in an environment where you passed your work off to other people using other programs. So when you're dealing with a production pipeline that uses multiple programs, not all of these kinds of tools will pass and be recognized by another program. So depending on the file format, um, if I used edge crease here and I passed it off as an OBJ to someone else using Maya or whatever, it may not translate. Now with the advent of the FBX file format, a lot of those problems have been solved, but I kinda, I'm kind of i kind of old school, so um, that's why I still do that. It's really more out of habit than anything. So that's a really good question. And let me just say that anytime you use a tool in Blender or any other program, there are at least half a dozen other tools that you aren't using and that someone else is using to great effect. So every time you use a tool, you're making a decision to not use others. And I don't know that there's really one right way to do anything involving 3D animation or Blender or whatever. It's a toolbox, and you ought to be able to dig in there and use whichever tools that you want or whichever ones that will work for you. So great questions. Thank you for your comments and questions. Um, keep that up. It's, a, it's really good to keep me on my toes here. All right, let's um, mirror this over to the other side. What I'm going to do is combine these two objects with Control J. Now I can just duplicate this and rotate it around the Y axis 180 degrees and move it over so we can do that. We can also come down here to Object and go to Mirror. And I can use Interactive Mirror or choose an axis directly. So what I'll do is I'll press Shift D to duplicate come down here to Object Mirror, choose X Global, that'll flip it around, I'll hit Enter, and then move it over to the other side. All right, so there we have our boot. Now what I can do is select all the individual pieces here, and then combine them together, and then mirror the boot over as well. So I'll press Control J, and then I will move this pivot point into the center of the grid by going to Set Origin and Origin to 3D Cursor. And also I should make sure that the transforms are in place, that I've got zeros in my rotation and ones in my scale, and I don't. I've got this .055 in here. So I'm going to go ahead and press Control A and choose Rotation and Scale just to reset my transformations. And then I can come over here and press Add Modifier and add a mirror modifier to it. And I'm mirroring around the x-axis or along the x-axis, I should say. Now, one thing I'm noticing here is that the normals of this particular object that I mirrored and then combined 
are flipped or they're turned inside out. So what I can do is come over here and tab into edit mode and then to select all of these faces I can just hover over a component and press the L key and I'll do that here too. And now to flip the normals out, I'll press Control N, and that will recalculate the normals to point outward. Now, if you ever need the normals to flip inward, you can always just click this inside checkbox, and that will flip them inward. All right, so there we go. That helps that. So now we've got the boots for Captain Quark. Now at some point in time we're going to have to apply the mirror, but I'm going to wait until we're completely through adjusting proportions and things like that. And speaking of proportions, it looks like now that we have the boots in, the fingers don't look so grotesquely long, which I guess is good. Um, yeah, I was planning on having to adjust those, but I'm not going to do it quite yet. It, they don't look too bad now. So. Let's take a look at the belt on the character. I'm going to go to the front view and the orthographic view here. And let's take a look at the belt here. You know, I just realized I didn't turn on my screencast keys, so we haven't been recording what I've been doing. My apologies there. I can just come down here and turn this on. There we go. Sorry about that. To create this belt, I think what I'll do is just duplicate some faces right off the character. So if we bring the character back in layer 1 and hit the Z key and tab into edit mode here, let's see what we can find to duplicate. How about this row of faces here? Let's take a look. That's probably pretty close. We're going to have to do a little bit of adjusting once we duplicate it, but let's try this. So with this row of faces selected, I'll then press Shift-D to duplicate them. I can scale it out with the S key just a little bit, like that. And then I'm going to have to go through and adjust these edges so they're a little bit straighter. I can select this edge here, and then I can scale it in the Z-axis and flatten it down like that. And the same goes for the bottom. I'll do that. Just flatten that out. And then let's go to one of the orthographic views and just see if we can move this around to get it in place. So I'll just grab this and move it down a bit, tilt it a hair, and maybe even scale it in the Z a little bit like that so it's a little bit thicker. All right. So that's going to be the belt of the character. Let's go ahead and split this off to a new object. I'll do that by pressing the P key and then choose Selection. And now it's its own object. And I'm going to go ahead and name it over here. I'll just call it Belt so we know what that is. Now to add a little thickness to this, I don't want to actually put polygons on the inside by using something like the solidify modifier or even extruding the whole thing. I just want to select these edges here and I want to scale them in. Now I'll be adjusting this a little bit more I think to fit to the body but I think right now I'll just hit E to extrude and then I want to scale in in the Y and the X but not the Z so I'll press S and then shift Z and now I'm scaling just in the X and the Y and I'll move those in like that. Now of course we're going to need some edge loops or crease tool whichever. Uh, I'm going to insert um, an edge loop here and bring it up and one here and bring it down. One other thing I'd like to do while we're here is go ahead and close off the top of the gloves. Let's go ahead and do that. So I'm just going to take this edge and hit E and extrude it in just a smidge and then I'll extrude again and bring that in a little bit more. And now I'm going to take this and extrude it and pull it down into the glove. Let me go to the front view here and I'll move this down and scale it in a bit like this and extrude one more time and scale that in as well. There we go. 
I just want to have it so you can't see down into it. And I may need more edges to get that to work, but let's just try and get this for now. There we go. So just for now, so we can't see down in there, we'll see how it works once we get a material on there as well. Well, we're coming along pretty well. He's actually beginning to look like Captain Quark here. We've got the boots and the gloves and the beginnings of the belt. In the next video, we'll work a little bit more on that belt. Well, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. If you'd like to learn more about Blender, then join me for my Blender Scene Creation course. In it, we'll create this animated scene of a mech descending into an underground tomb. As we go, you'll be introduced to Blender's modeling tool set as we build the mech character and the environment. We'll talk about manipulating objects, the difference between object mode and edit mode. And as we begin modeling the mech, we'll discuss more advanced topics, like cutting one 3D object with another using booleans. We'll talk about object origins and parenting, creating geometry with the bridge tool, and creating tubes or pipes with Bezier curves. We'll create the elements of the environment, the pillars, the walls, and we'll add more detailed scene elements along the way. Once the modeling is complete, we'll talk about UV mapping, what it is, why it's needed, and how Blender's UV mapping toolset can help you UV map your 3D objects quickly and efficiently. We'll take a look at Blender's Cycles Render Engine as we add the materials for the mech and the environment. We'll use the free open source image editing program, GIMP, to prepare and edit our textures and apply them to the 3D models in the environment and on the mech. Ultimately, we'll want our character to move, so we'll go over preparing the character for rigging, creating the armature, and how to set up an advanced foot roll rig. We'll create custom shapes and make sure all our controls are parented and organized, ready for animating. We'll begin animating our character flying into the scene and dropping to the ground. We'll use Blender's graph editor and dope sheet to adjust the timing, and we'll talk about keyframing and tangents as well. Once our scene is complete and we've animated the character, we'll do some final tweaks to the lighting, as well as have some fun creating a jet flame effect for our mech's jetpack. And in the end, we'll render out the animation and export a movie file. Bringing an animated scene to life is an amazing process. And once you know how to do it, you can bring any of your ideas to life. So join me for Blender Scene Creation. Learn more at DarrenLyle.com.